Um, for those coming in late, that, that's fine. There'll be a recording of this. All right, so hello and welcome. My name is Tom Morgan, and I'm a Senior Assistant Director of Admissions here at Clark University. Thank you for joining us this evening for our faculty discussion panel, and congratulations on your admissions decision. This is an exciting time of the year, and we're happy to have you here with us. So the purpose of this session is to hear from our faculty about what it's like studying at Clark. So I encourage you to ask questions. Uh, and I wanna thank all our panelists for being here today um, in advance. So thank you so much. Uh, like I said, purpose here, we want you to ask questions. Um, but before introducing our panelists, I wanna quickly go over some of the logistics of how asking questions in this webinar will work. We highly encourage you to ask panelists questions. And if you wanna do that, go ahead and use the Q&A section in Zoom. Uh, we want to reserve the chat functionality in Zoom for anyone who's experiencing technical issues. So if you want to ask our panelists some questions, go ahead and use the Q&A section. Clark by the numbers. So many of you might have already checked out some of this on our website and, and doing your own research, but for those who haven't, just want to go over this real quickly. Um, so here at Clark, we have a 10 to 1 student to faculty ratio. We have over 50 plus majors and minors across three different colleges. So students at Clark are studying things like psychology, English, music, biology and chemistry, management, interactive media design. 71% uh, of our classes have fewer than 20 students. And then in regard to these final two bullet points, we'll get a little bit more into this with our panelists, but all students at Clark have the opportunity to participate in hands-on learning and 100% of students complete a capstone, which for those who are unfamiliar with what a capstone is, um, it's essentially your culminating project uh, at the end of senior year, uh, your passion project, whatever that looks like. So let's get into it. So we are joined by four panelists here today, and I'll introduce them, and then we'll jump right into some of the Q&A. So first, we have John Aylward and John's an associate professor um, with music composition and theory. We got Liz Blake, assistant professor, professor of English, Donald Spratt, associate professor of chemistry and biochemistry, and Teresa Quinn from the School of Management, who is the entrepreneurship and innovation program manager. So thank you all for joining us here today. Um, so we'll just kind of get started a little bit round robin style. So if each one of you could introduce yourselves and um, including, you know, what you most like to research. So John, would you like to start? Yeah, I'll start. Sure. Uh, th and, and thank you for having me and, and hello to everyone. Um, very happy to be here. My name is John Aylward. I am uh, Associate Professor of Music Composition and Theory. Uh, in the music program within the visual and performing arts department at Clark. And uh, right now I'm working on a chamber opera and I just released a CD of chamber music um, on new focus recordings. So uh, those have been kind of my uh, projects this, this, uh, this year, releasing the album and finishing this, this chamber opera. All right, fantastic. Um, Liz? Yeah, I'm Liz Blake. I am assistant professor of English. I'm also affiliate faculty in women's and gender studies. And my research is primarily in the field of modernist literature, which is the literature of the beginning of the 20th century. Um, though I also really go all the way up to the present. And I'm currently at work on a book project that is about modernism, bringing together the fields of food studies and queer studies. So thinking about representations of eating as forms of queer pleasure. Thank you. Donald? Everybody, I'm Don Spratt, an associate professor in the Carlson School of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Clark. Um, I'm interested in enzymes and understanding how proteins keep us healthy, and when proteins malfunction, why they cause disease. Um, my lab is funded by the NIH. We just got a grant um, to fund us for the next three years, which is awesome. And um, yeah, like, I like, like Liz says, I also like food. So I teach a course on kitchen chemistry here at Clark, and we're in the midst of actually trying to set up a, a food studies concentration where you would be able to take courses 
in many different fields across many di different interdisciplinary departments at Clark. And we're hoping to have that rolled out in spring 2023. All right, and Teresa. Hi, my name is Teresa Quinn and, and congratulations on being accepted to Clark. It's a great school, very fun. Um, I am the program manager of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program here at Clark, but I also am an adjunct professor and I do teach um, a class in creating a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and although I don't do research, we do follow the research of John Dobson, who is a entrepreneurship professor here at Clark. And as we get into things more, I take it that uh, we're gonna be led with some questions here. Um, I'll be able to explain a little bit more, but every class that we have within the entrepreneurship minor is hands-on. So I'm excited to, to talk more about that. Awesome, and we'll, we'll definitely get into that aspect of, of learning here at Clark as well. Um, so again, just a reminder, if, if folks have any questions for our panelists, definitely put those in the, the, the Q&A there, um, utilize that in Zoom, and then the chat is going to be used for technical issues. So I have a question here. Um, so do you have a favorite class that you've taught at Clark? What is that, what is that class? And this is up for anyone who wants to just kind of answer the question. Without a doubt, my favorite class is my first year intensive. I, I teach that in the fall and then I teach it as a regular course in the spring, but I, I teach it to only first and second years. And I, I just absolutely love those first and second years. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you. But the class that I teach, like I said, is um, ENT 105, Creating Culture of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And I've taught it now over two universities. And I, I absolutely love the course because of the excitement that comes out of Clark students in this class. And they, they have to do two main projects while they're in this class. And their focus always tends to be, how can we make Clark better? And it's not, how can we make Clark better because it's not doing well. It's completely opposite. They get so caught up in all the wonderful things that are going on on Clark's campus that they want to add to it. And so their projects have been extremely dynamic. And I just love that class and love first years. Absolutely love the first years. Awesome. Uh, anyone else? Don, did you want to talk about a favorite class perhaps that you have? Oh, well, all my classes I love teaching. That's why oh, I like sorry, them. I right? but, uh, John. Sorry. Oh, I said John. I apologize. John, John and Don, they're so they're so similar. Don, sorry. <laughs> well, we, we definitely get answers from both of you. Um, so John, if you want to begin, and then Don, you can go follow up that works um sure sure and don if if i miss if i miss here john and don again please forgive me um well i mean i love all the classes i teach and uh you know i think we're all here we're, we all like you know we could be doing work elsewhere we're here to teach we love to teach you know i don't want to speak for everybody but uh actually um my colleagues are so fabulous that way we you know we share that joy of teaching and um i teach a composition seminar every year um young composers wanting to write in every different genre every different aesthetic all kinds of music and it's just fascinating to guide them on their journeys whatever they're writing whatever they're doing so it's just great to see the diversity of expression all the different kinds of thought and creativity that go into writing music whether it's for film or for the concert hall or uh, we have a new game design program. So we have composers writing music for game design now. Um, there's just a lot of excitement in seeing what everybody's writing. And um, I always think of it as a kind of fashion show, the composition seminar, because everyone's coming out with new pieces and uh, the creativity is just very high. And it's a great class to teach. It's one, it's one of many, though, that I really enjoy teaching. That's just one example. Uh, Don, would you like to follow up? Yeah, sorry about that, John. I didn't know we were going to have similar names. Just, just happens sometimes. Yeah, that, so that could be on me as well. So no it's, worries. It's all there. good. Yeah, but we all have one syllable names. Um, so my favorite course I like to teach is called Protein Chemistry. It's it's my specialty. I typically teach it for juniors and seniors majoring in chemistry or biochemistry at Clark. And the whole port, point of the project, they have a re, they have a semester long research proposal they write about. So I've had students write about 
um, venom proteins found from ants or snakes, or we've had people talk about trying to make inhibitors for pro or uh, drug and drug pumps that are found in bacteria. So these antibiotics will still work and things. So they're coming up with really innovative ideas. And I basically just teach them ideas or uh, proposals and methods to how they go about doing that. And they come up with the actual experimental design. So that's one of those like capstone courses that Tom was alluding to earlier about, you know, a course culminating with all that knowledge you've been working on. And uh, what's, what's really enjoyable about it is, you know, a lot of kids, they, they realize that the skills they're learning in these types of courses can be applied to the real world and understanding how that can be applied to uh, getting a job or, um, you know, getting, getting a good, strong science career afterwards, too. So that's, that's my favorite course to teach. I also like to teach a course on science career development, which is focused on how to write and uh, make proper application materials and hearing about stories from former Clarkies who are doing jobs in science and coming back and you know sharing what their experiences were, the obstacles they've gone through, and how they can actually, you know, impart some good wisdom onto our students as well. All right, so I actually have a question or two coming through the um, the Q and A here, and this actually kind of is is a is a great question here about research that a student has. So, question is: Are students um, able to choose what research they want? to be a part of, uh, or are students assigned to different projects? How is the process of students getting involved in research? So essentially, what is the process for students who want to get involved in research? What does that look like here at Clark? And, and this can be for any of our panelists. I can Let's start. Um, I think this really looks pretty different in the humanities than it looks in the sciences where we don't have labs in the same sense. But one thing that we have in the English department that's really exciting is a recent fellowship for student faculty pairs where students can work with faculty to do funded research based on either, and this is really up to the individual pair, working on a project that the student is invested in, that the faculty offers guidance and support, or giving the student a chance to contribute to faculty research. And this is something that has started in, I think the last two years and really gives a chance to recognize the kind of mentorship and let the student and faculty focus on building a project together, which I think is really exciting. Um, most of the research that students do in the English department is under faculty guidance in the form of a thesis or a capstone, but this is a new thing that we've just started that's really thrilling. All right, fantastic. Um, Teresa, I think maybe we'll go to you for this one. Um, again, another question that came in here about uh, mentoring. And it said, can you speak about the mentoring that faculty do with new students? Because you talked a little bit about the first year intensive. Um, and this could really be for anyone who wants to talk about that. But yeah, um, can you speak about the mentoring that faculty do with new students? Um, sure. As you mentioned early on, um, our classes are small. And so each first year intensive class that comes in has no more than 16 students in it. And this is to get that additional mentorship. And, and a student will take whatever course of interest that they want. They're not put in that course, they get to choose it. So that's the first great thing is a student gets to pick a class for their first year intensive of personal interest. It might not be the direction they actually go for when it comes to their major, but back to the mentoring part of it, those students that come into that first year class work with that professor for up to two years of individual one-on-one -on -one mentoring, helping them facilitate you know, all the things that go with being a first year, but also help them decide on what major they're gonna go with and then get them transferred over that. Right now we're in the middle of it as, as advising and I'm having all my, my students that started two years ago, I call it jumping ship because they, they have finally decided what major they're gonna go to. And it's been so exciting to work with them over these past years. As, as they discover all the different things that Clark has to offer. And you know, some of them will stay with entrepreneurship because again, that's my field. And some will go to the music. Actually quite a few have been going to the music. 
department. So um, yeah, it, that's just one of the many mentoring uh, facets that I think Clark offers um, is just that first year intensive. We are there for the student from beginning until they decide what major they're going to go with. Sure. Uh, would anyone else, any, any, any other panelists like to speak a little bit about the, the first year uh, intensive experience? All right. Yeah, no worries. Um, got another question that came in here in the Q&A. Um, someone had said, love the comment about joy of teaching. To what extent are professors involved in real world projects versus academics? So I think they're looking at some of the aspects of, of what it means to, to be learning in, in the real world. Um, and what does that look like here at Clark? I know that, you know, one of the things that we do have are those problems of practice courses. Um, so maybe some, some folks on our panel can, can speak a little bit about that. We have a pretty cool uh, problems of practice course um, where we bring um, uh, faculty together. It's, it's a co-taught course. I, I, don't, I don't remember the number or even the name. It's quite a long name about um, basically, it's a course on music and community engagement, and it's a co-taught course where two of our faculty will work together with students, bringing our Clarkies into um, a neighboring music school. Uh, there are some local uh, middle school and high schools with music programs where our Clarkies, under the supervision of these two co-teaching co faculty, will work in tandem with the Clarkies to teach music in the schools. So there's a kind of three tiers of en engagement and learning in this course. It's a very interesting course. It's really, really cool. And uh, basically the, pr the problem of practice in this course is really the, the practice of teaching music in a middle school, high school environment that, that um, what, you know, what, is the, what is the practice there? What are the problems that come up in that practice and the idea that it's happening, you are learning by doing, you're under the supervision of your faculty, mentors, teachers, but you're actually doing it. And then when you go back into your own classroom with your two faculty mentors, you are learning the pedagogy around how to teach. And then you're implementing it uh, in the classroom in the high schools and middle schools. It's a really interesting way of um, preparing students to be teachers. Uh, even though you have to obviously go on and get your teaching certification, a lot of people get teaching certifications. They've never taught music in the classroom. So I, I love this class because we do have people stay on for the fifth year and get a teaching certification. Maybe they get a graduate degree in, in, in teaching. They've had the music background. They go on, they get the teaching degree. And then we've given them this really interesting course where they're already equipped to teach music in the schools. So um, I know that many departments have problems of practice classes, uh, and I'm sure they work very similarly. I do think that that is a really interesting kind of class that we offer. And uh, I, I particularly like the way that works in the music program. I'm getting a couple questions here that are um, for specific panelists. So actually, John, if we could continue with you. Um, Someone has a question about the availability. What's availability like for music recording spaces on campus, whether it be for studios or other recordings, other recording spaces? Um, how often are they open and how would they book a session? Like, what does that look like? So we have a dedicated recording studio. It's fabulous. It's run by Professor John Freyermuth. And um, that is a full studio. It has a separate booth to record in. Uh, for um, if you're dubbing in instruments or if you want to record tracks separately. Um, and then the recording studio itself is great for mixing, mastering. And then we also have all the gear to record outside of the recording studio. So for example, if the recording studio is booked, you can reserve the microphones and work with Professor Freyermuth to record at the Floor Music Center or Daniel's Theater uh, or in a practice room. And as, as I'm sure many of you know, you can record in some very small spaces and still make great recordings if you have the right equipment. We've got great microphones. We also have a recording booth in Razzo Hall, 
in the Traina Center. We have a about 250 seat um, chamber theater, chamber music theater, and that has a booth and a recording facility. So we'll record jazz and classical music there. Mostly we'll record more popular music and different kinds of um, uh, cross genre music in the recording studio or at the Floor Music Center, which is a great live space, easy to work in. So, I mean, there's plenty of access to all of that. And uh, we're also building inside of the new um, um, design center. There's, there are going to be in the new, in the new structure we're building, there are going to be rooms for recording audio for video and audio for film. There are going to be new, new places to record there. I haven't seen all the specs on that, but I think that those are also going to be available uh, recording facilities starting not this fall, but next. But already, we already have a lot of great recording facilities. Does that, do you think that answers the question, Tom? Yeah, no, I think that's great. And, and in terms of that new interdisciplinary building, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can just kind of do a quick Google search, Clark Now. I, I know that there was like a press release a few weeks ago where they, they're showing what it looks like. Um, slated for fall 2023. So mm -hmm. we're really excited about that. Um, Liz, what John's telling, I think it's useful to know too that those music spaces, and this is also kind of an answer to the previous question, those recording spaces aren't just for music. Um, we had a professor in the English department in the creative writing section recently doing a sound installation where this professor who is himself a poet worked with students to do a recording of one of their poems that was then part of a gallery show in New York. So these are resources that are being used across campus in ways that aren't necessarily obvious to the disciplines, but are bringing, bringing collaboration between departments. And the other thing to note about that is that this is a professor who was doing you know, their own work, their own writing in the real world, but also involving students in that, asking students who had taken classes from them and who had acting experience to be involved in putting together this sound installation. So this was a, an opportunity for students to be involved in faculty work and in creating something pretty exciting. So Liz, I was going to follow up with you because um, there's there's another question about um, they wanted someone you to speak a little bit about the creative writing minor, and then second question, which I think you kind of got to a little bit. Um, we also had someone ask a question about what the a research element here at Clark where there was uh, a cross sectional project um, that stood out um, in, in in your mind. So could you? speak to one or both of those things potentially? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about creative writing, which is housed within the English department and is a really growing part of the English department. Um, we offer courses in poetry and fiction, kind of standard versions of creative writing, but we also offer a lot of really innovative courses, including a bilingual English-Spanish course called Writing the Borderlands, um, a course that, and a lot of courses that engage with literature and ask students to think through thematic topics and experiment between genres. Creative writing students also do complete a capstone, which is a larger creative writing project that's more substantive at the end of their time. The other thing that I really think is great about our creative writing program is that it involves taking two classes in literature. So students aren't just doing workshop and getting some ideas about craft. They're also really invited to read and think about situating themselves in literary history. So we got a lot of really exciting projects. And one thing that's great about creative writing at Clark too is that you don't have to be an English major. They're, it's a separate program housed within the major. So we get a lot of creative writing majors who are act, or minors who are actually science majors and majoring in other things entirely, which means they do some pretty cool and unexpected projects. Awesome. Um, another question, this is for anyone on the panel, and I think this kind of ties into a lot of the answers we've had about, you don't need to necessarily be pursuing just this one academic interest, like you can use the recording space. You don't, you know, you can be an environmental science major, but also then have a creative writing minor. Um, 
would any of you be able to generally kind of speak about, well, how would you describe a, a Clark student? If you could describe a Clark student, what does a Clark student look like? In terms of their interests and things that they're into, the research. Don, I saw you unmuted. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a I'll take a stab at this. So what I what I think in general with Clark students is they are uh, they're driven to help change the world and make it make an make an impact. They also um, have a, a very strong sense of community as well. So like I I I say this all the time, but Worcester is the heart of Massachusetts or the Commonwealth, and I think Clark is the heart of Worcester because everybody seems to care a lot at Clark for people's well-being, people's growth in education. I think there's a lot of like really good tangible benefits of being at Clark. Um, but like I said, that they're driven, they're passionate, they want to be inspired, they want to be engaged, and you know. Pursuing your passions and stuff at Clark is, an, is a great opportunity for a lot of people to actually get involved in those types of things. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else would like to comment? I would just add briefly that there is a really diverse set of interests among the student body and often in individual students. The example of being an environmental science major and a creative writing minor seems totally normal at Clark. And so many of our students major in multiple things. Have I have an advisee with two majors and a minor, and that seems pretty standard. But there's a sense that you can really combine different disciplines in ways that aren't obvious and that students are also really engaged in student clubs. I mean, Don pointed out the question of community, but there's a real active culture of creating the community that they want, which I think is really exciting. I wanted to just follow up with the community part of it. John has mentioned it, Don has mentioned now Liz has mentioned it. Um, it's everywhere at Clark is that that community engagement even our, our two cap, two of our three capstones for the um, entrepreneurship minor are involved with the community. One is through a food truck. Well, they actually go out and work within the community. Sometimes they invite uh, community members to be a part of that event, um, but it is just like the other three panelists mentioned, it, it's really the heart of Clark, Clarkies, I should say. Fantastic. Uh, Liz, I know you, you spoke a little bit um, about advising. Um, so I did have a question that came in here as well. And I think this is getting back to one of the earlier questions that we had about the first year intensive. So I might reframe it a little bit. Um, how does advising work for students here at Clark? And this is up for anyone, right? Because you said you had an advisee. Um, so how does advising work here at Clark? And you know, how do students, how are they assigned those advisors from the start? Um, speaking a little bit about their, their pre-major advisor potentially with first year intensive. Um, and then what does that kind of relationship at Clark look like? So if anyone have, they have like an advisee, um, can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, so I think I can speak for all of us. We've been going through a lot of advising meetings this week, actually, ourselves, because it's prime time for students to get ready for registering for fall 2022. Um, one of the benefits of that is, too, it's not just transactional where you come and get a pin, but it's an opportunity for a faculty member to touch base, see how you're doing, um, ask about what your, your future plans are. Even if you might not have any, you might wanna start pointing them at you know, having conversations with people about what they might wanna get into. Um, it's that personal touch of Clark that makes it a little more special because you can actually speak with a faculty member and you know, sort of express your interest in something. It's like, well, you know what? You might wanna to talk to this person on campus. They have research in this area or they have a club that's in this part. And this is a way to sort of find, it's like, it's, it's basically networking one-on-one -on -one. Uh, in all honesty, students are getting to learn about different things. And one of the pleasures of being a faculty member at Clark is to get to know students through advising as well. And, um, you know, sharing in their successes along, along the way. Liz, I also saw that you wanted to comment. Yeah, I mean, I also think maybe we should have Teresa talk a little bit about the first year advising, because it sounds like she has more experience in that. 
Um, but I would just second Don's point that there's something really fun about advising season in that students are coming in and really thinking in interesting ways about what classes are going to fit together. And I think I always learn something from my students in the course of advising where they've got an idea about what they want to take that wouldn't necessarily have occurred to me. And you learn a lot about what kinds of classes they're interested in and what fits together. And that can often help you see connections between the curriculum, just in terms of how concretely they're following their own interests. A, a student, for example, might take my food and literature course and Don's chemistry in the kitchen, is that what it's called, course, and understand those as part of a cohesive program of study in a way that sort of directly leads into the fact that we're developing a food studies program right now. And they don't need us to show them that often, but it's also something that we can show them, which I think is great. Um, this is actually kind of a good segue too, because we did get a couple questions here in the chat about um, registering for courses at Clark, what that looks like. I know, Don, you said, you know, fall 2022 registrations coming up, things like that. Um, are there ever, you know, are there ever classes or situations that happen where students really want to sign up for a class, but for whatever reason, they're not able to, to sign up for the class or anything like that? And if so, you know, what does that what does that look like down the road in terms of them being able to, to take the class that they want eventually? Um, I would say that in, in all honesty, it's a mad dash at eight o'clock in the morning on the day most students register. Um, and those are the days that are exciting and kind of foreboding for me myself, because sometimes my class is, is full within like three, three minutes. But if students reach out and they are planning on graduating and they need to have a course to complete that, that graduation, we are able to have some looser caps on some courses, which allow students to get into the course and not feel like they've been excluded because of something like that. Um, if, if per chance, say they're a first or second year student and they didn't get into the course that first time, Rest assured, the faculty member will probably remember your name and make sure you get in the next time as well. So there is some, some built-in things. But if you are a senior, faculty will work with you to try to make sure you get all those requirements done and make sure that the registrar's office knows that you're going to have all your, 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 uh, your on track to graduate on time. Yeah, I, I'd like to throw something in about the, the advising and you're right, eight o'clock, it is a mad dash. And as working with, with first years and second years, a little bit of second years, in the very beginning, when we start advising me with my, my first years, I kind of teach them a little bit of a strategy on how to get the classes that they want, because there is a strategy to it. You know, if you're a first year, these are the ones you're going to get. If you're looking at kitchen chemistry, which is a huge one, and they do fill up in three minutes, let's start putting that into your schedule, maybe the third year when you get to go in and register your for your classes earlier. So kind of put that on your back burner as, yeah, that's the class I want to take. Yes, it's going to fill up, but let's strategically look at how we can get it into your schedule if you want to use that class to take care of your, your science perspective. So that's one of the things we do in, in that whole eight o'clock in the morning. I tell them, Yep, make sure you have your hotspot going in case everything crashes. It doesn't crash, but you know, just be ready because some of those really important classes or really fun classes, classes that are in high demand, they, they do, they fill up. But again, and I know I'm not the only professor and advisor that works with students to, to help them with the strategy. It really is a strategy. I just awesome. wanna add one right, thing. Ahead. Given that, that this is an audience of students who are potential about to be first years, that a lot of students also, a lot of classes reserve a block of seats for first years for incoming students. Um, so for example, this fall, I teach a class called Queer Literature, which is a class with 20 seats. Five of them are reserved for first years. So I can't even put anyone in those until first years have registered. So don't worry that because we've already been through this year's Mad Dash, there won't be room for next year. Okay. Yeah, we take that. We take that really seriously. We go through and look for those held for first years, uh, first and second years only. You know, we I, I really try to teach them how to look for all those kind of things. 
And a lot of classes do have those reserved for five, 10, because I know a few of my classes do too. Cool. Um, I want to transition over to um, the capstone. Um, so could the panelists talk about um, some of the examples of capstones that are in your department? This is for anyone. I could say a few words about um, maybe VPA capstones. Um, um, so I'm in the music program, uh, but my department is the visual and performing arts department. So art history, studio art, theater, screen, uh, and media, culture and the arts, and now the Becker School of Design. Uh, and so the capstones are very varied within the department based on what program they're in and what particular field of interest with even within that program of uh, the student will be make, working on the capstone in. So in music, we'll have capstones in performance and a performance capstone will most likely be a recital. A uh, composition capstone will be a portfolio of works and I oversee all the composition capstones. So we'll look at a portfolio of three to five to eight works, depending on their length and depending on what they're for. If they're shorter works like an EP, then we'll, we'll wanna have um, maybe five or six pieces on an EP. If there are a selection of chamber works, maybe three different kinds of chamber works. Um, some students will have a jazz, uh, jazz composition portfolio and perhaps they'll be performing in that portfolio. Um, so that's, uh, there, there's also a technology capstone uh, for tech majors, and that will be mixing and mastering uh, maybe a few EPs or larger sets of works, maybe a few concerts, mastering a few live events. And then uh, there's a music criticism and music history, kind of a musicology capstone, which will be more scholarly, a large paper or a few papers or uh, works that might be uh, submitted as, as articles, uh, maybe continue to be re revised. So in that process, the students who are working on these capstone seniors will work, I, I, I will, will work one-on-one -on -one with these students to, to make the capstone happen. And my colleagues in their fields, musicology, technology, and performance will also work individually. So by the time you get to the capstone in the VPA, you are working one-on-one -on -one with your um, advisor and mentor to produce your capstone. We also fold that in, and I think a lot of departments do this, uh, we fold it into a kind of whatever, you're, whatever concentration you're in, we fold it into a kind of portfolio. So we're looking at your capstone project, but also while you are doing that, you're kind of concatenating previous work. We usually host that on a website so that by the time you graduate, you have a website with your CV, with your academic record, anything you'd like to put on, maybe ancillary works, and your featured capstone, so that when you're interviewing or auditioning, you have a website that will direct people to all of your work. And we find that to be pretty uh, helpful for students who are graduating and going on the job market or going into graduate school. It's very, very helpful for a graduate school portfolio to just have it online along with all of your other uh, visa materials. So for us, we kind of see the capstone as being holistically integrated into that larger portfolio of your work, put online and, and put forward out in, in terms of being a, a large professional document, so to speak. Would any of the other panelists like to speak a little bit about Capstones, um, Don. What, yeah, sure. What does what, what the capstone look like in the sciences? Yeah, so there, there's many different flavors of capstone that people can complete. One is the classic honors research, where students will write a thesis on their studies that they've been doing and presenting in front of the department at the end of the year. There is the directed study, which can be um, doing research in a person's lab for a semester or even for the full year. There is internship possibilities where people can join local biotech companies or chemical companies in the Worcester area and go and do work in those places if they want to, to get some industrial experience. And we also have courses that can also can act as a capstone. So I already mentioned protein chemistry, but there are other ones related to uh, 
Home biology, they have a course on microbiomes, which is about bacteria in your gut. There's ones on viruses, uh, cancer biology. Um, in chemistry, we have chemical biology. We have, um, I'm teaching a new course called Enzyme Reaction Mechanisms. There are many different flavors that you can do to get involved in types of capstone work. And, uh, you know, in the spirit of the capstone, you had to know a lot of stuff in all your first, second year, and third year courses to even get to those courses in the first place. So, um, using the analogy of a capstone, the capstone is the top wall on a brick, and you're using bricks of courses to get up to that point. So, um, doing honors research, internship, direct study, or taking a course as a capstone is, a, is many different ways you can complete that type of requirement for your degree. What about um, at the School of Management? What, what, would, what would a capstone look like, Teresa? Sure. Um, the School of Management and entrepreneurship, although they're in the same school, which is the School of Management, they are very different. Uh, the School of Management will have a, a very um, broad capstone where it will cover absolutely everything that you, you know, all the different topics that you had throughout your, your four years, as, as was said. But for entrepreneurship, that's where I can speak, is the entrepreneurship is only a minor at Clark. We don't have it as a major. And, and a lot of times that's a problem for some people, but in reality, I think it's the best way to go. As an example, with music, I know I keep going back to the music because right now I have several students that are going the music direction and would like to complement their major in music with a minor in entrepreneurship. I have one now that I think he's going to take over the world in music, but you know that's just my personal opinion of him. But what what happens in this in this minor is you take two um, core courses your, or your requirements. You take two of those, then you take these three electives in the middle, and they could be anything from social entrepreneurship to you know down and dirty starting your business. Um, you know, a, a more of a marketing feel. You know, there's there's several different. Um, electives in the middle. Then, I know, long story short, for this capstone, we have one class in capstone, but we can choose from th three different areas. One is community-based entrepreneurship. Again, we've incorporated a food truck, so we could go out into the community with it. So again, very hands-on, um, very hands-on. And then we have another one that is, okay, you started a business your first year, because I know somebody asked, can I start my first year, first semester? Absolutely. So you started this business and you decided to work it through your whole four years. You know, you might have taken some time off. You might have really put some concentration into it. But now here comes your fourth year in entrepreneurship and you really want to get this thing rolling. You really want to see if maybe it even will support you after you graduate. That's what another one of our capstones is are is and then the third capstone that we have and this one is not offered as often it's kind of hit or miss especially now with covid unfortunately but it's an international entrepreneurship capstone where they actually go the students actually go to another country and learn entrepreneurship in an international setting what we're hoping for and keeping our fingers crossed for this year is I guess it would actually be next year when you all come in, is the spring of 2023, they're hoping for a trip to Mexico to see how entrepreneurship is ingrained in their culture. And so those are the three capstones. I know that was quite a long story, but you really can choose which direction you'd like to go with your capstone in entrepreneurship. And again, I, I can't say it enough, but I love to support these different majors, you know, even even the creative writing, maybe we need to do something entrepreneurial with that. The sciences, maybe you've got this great idea for, you know, especially with the food and everything, you know, there's, there's so many great majors on campus that entrepreneurship can support. And that's how I really look at the entrepreneurship minors. It supports all the majors on campus. That's my long story. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, I do have a few specific questions that have come in here as well. Um, so this one's for Liz. Um, Liz, how many English majors are there um, roughly and what type, and we were just kind of talking about potential um, co-curricular activities that bring together English majors as a community. Um, I am not sure of the exact number of English majors, to be honest with you. Um, I know that the number of seniors we've had 
is about 25 this year. So I think if you multiply, someone else should do the math because I'm an English professor. Um, and yeah, I think that's about right, but maybe don't quote me on that. And the other question was about co-curricular activities that bring English majors together. Um, so I'm gonna sneak in an answer to the capstone question with that, if that's okay. Um, because the way we do capstone is that everyone, all of the graduating seniors take a class together. And in that class, they tend to read one very big important novel that is in the field of whoever's teaching that class. Um, so that was Moby Dick, that's been, uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved, those are just recent examples. And then each one of them pursues an independent research project and has they have a kind of mini conference where they present those research projects to each other. I think this is a really important culminating experience in terms of using the research skills that they've developed over the course of their time at Clark, but also sharing in that experience. It's something that is really pursued in community. They're working together throughout it. And I often, when I see seniors, they'll be talking to each other about their projects. I'm teaching a class right now for the seniors who were invited to write honors theses. And they're constantly referring back to the capstone papers and saying, I love this about your capstone paper. This was so interesting. This was so smart. So there's a real sense of academic community within the department organized by these shared experiences. Um, this isn't really a curricular answer, but one other thing that I think is really nice about the way the English department specifically functions is that we have a lot of social activities as a department. Every year we have wassail at the end of the semester, which is a kind of celebration of winter. We have spring fling. We have a lot of events that bring students into the house. And we also talk at some of those some of them are just fun, but some of them are designed to help students think about careers after Clark and what you can do with an English degree. So we have a regular event called Chowder Fest where we, yes, serve chowder, but also have alumni come in and talk about what they've done with their English major. And another event where we gather all of the English majors who work on campus at Clark, whether or not they went to Clark to join us and it includes librarians, it includes people in admissions, it includes people in career center, really all across the campus, which is a really lovely event as well. Awesome, and I know we're getting towards the end of the webinar and we still have a lot of questions coming in here as well. Um, so just if I'm not able to get to all the questions here, um, definitely reach out and we'll get the answers for them. Um, so a couple more that we have coming in here. Someone asked, to what extent are the students at Clark and the projects that they do involved in the local community? So looking at Clark beyond the four walls of the institution, um, would anyone like to take that question? I think I, I addressed that a little bit in the previous um, question about our problems of practice classes, but I'll just say very briefly that we're, our students are constantly performing in the community. And as I said, through the classes we're teaching, they're teaching in the community. So um, I think we are very much integrated into the community in terms of performance, teaching, and, and uh, other, other ways we're expressing ourselves in the community. It's a great part of the, of the program and the VPA in general. Fantastic. Another one that's come up is about student journeys um, on to like graduate school. Um, so what kind of, um, you know, what, what's it look like with students in your department where, where are they going to graduate school? Um, what types of things are they pursuing? Um, anyone like to pick that up? Sure, I'm happy to jump in. So I have a student who's currently doing a PhD in UCLA. Um, you know, students in our department have gone on to Brown University. Um, there's another student who's a, a, a graduating senior this year that'll be joined, going over to UMass Medical School next year to pursue a biological PhD. Um, people have gone abroad. Um, I have a student who's up in Canada right now doing the research in uh, Parkinson's studies. So there's a lot of different areas people can go to. Um, many of them do get into their first choice. And the reason why is because they actually get their hands dirty in a lab in an undergrad setting in the first place. 
And they also get uh, the opportunity to attend conferences and also um, they're able to, uh, which, which our department is able to pay for. We have funds available for that to cover those costs. But they also get to play co-authorship on these papers as well, which gets them a leg up and stuff. Um, and many students like to take advantage of that fifth year free master's program, which is brought up before as well. And the benefit of that is students get out of the whole idea of I got to take course, 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 course. And they're actually just starting to look at a project as a whole. And that's really a, a special year of metamorphosis where the student becomes, you know, ready to take on new challenges. And many of them are landing awesome jobs wherever they want to go. As soon as they get the interview, they're like, we want more Clarkies. So something's going right that we're, we're in our training and stuff as we go along. Thank you. Um, I've also had a few questions come through about um, the Becker School of Design and Technology and what's that been like at um, Clark. So one question that came up was they were curious about um, any ideas about where that is integrated potentially with other parts in our, in our curriculum. Um, and then, you know, any kind of crossover that you see. I know we kind of talked a little bit about this with some, maybe some visual and performing arts majors and minors. And um, so what does that look like at Clark currently? Well, that um, program is, is also really being integrated into our department of computer science, math and computer science. In fact, the building is going to house math and computer science as well as aspects of the visual and performing arts department namely film and screen studies and media and culture and the arts studies and the Becker School of Design. Those are the three programs. But getting back to something that Liz uh, said earlier, one of the really great things about being at Clark is that you don't need to be in those programs to be accessing those facilities, to be taking those classes, to be working with those faculty. It's a small, we're a small school. And uh, of course, those are the specializations but uh, you don't have to be um, a declared major to walk in the door, take those classes, meet the faculty, have an amazing experience, have an interdisciplinary experience. I do think that um, the student body is very interdisciplinary. So I expect that even though these are the three central aspects of that new building, um, there's going to be an immense amount of interdisciplinary um, work going on across the university in this in these in these new build outs that we have but i'm very excited that we have uh, uh, a, a new home for math and computer science parts of the visual and performing arts department film and screen and the school of design i would also note that there has been a lot of conversation between the bdst and creative writing in terms of thinking about narrative and courses that might think about world building as a kind of conception of game design, but also of course, creative writing. And that, and this is less directly related to the Becker School, that we also have had projects in the English department that study video games as literature. I am advising a master's thesis right now that's about Frankenstein and the video game Detroit Become Human, which probably is more familiar to some of you than it was to me when I started this project, but I have learned a lot. Right, and so my final question I have here is if you could take any one of your colleagues' classes, which course would you sign up for? Kitchen chemistry, I tell you, kitchen chemistry. <laughs> it's, it's happening in the fall, Teresa. You're welcome to join us. Um, I would take epidemiology after coming out of COVID. I'd love to know what's going on and why these different things are happening and how we can actually trace things better so we're prepared for the next, well, fingers crossed, prepared for anything that comes in the future and we know what we're doing as a whole. I would say in my own department and take uh, my colleagues class, the book in the early modern world, which gives students a chance to do hands-on research at the American Antiquarian Society, which is one of the foremost archives of Americana in this country and a really fascinating thing to get to do. My own research is too recent to get to work there because their collections stop at 1900, but they have some things that are just fascinating and be fun to work with. I love languages, so I would love to study a language, take a language class. 
Poetry is probably a close second. I'd love to take a poetry class um, or a creative writing class, Liz. So we'll have to talk about that, Liz. Okay, um, so I do see I have a couple more questions. And so I'm gonna respond to a few of those in chat, um, but also if anyone wants to reach out, um, you can certainly send us an email at admissions at clarku.edu. Um, and we'll be happy to help and get those specific questions answered. That is one of the other big takeaways I hope that everyone gets from this is that we, we have a small community here that is really involved, invested, and interested in what their students are doing. Um, so don't be a stranger. Um, once again, my name is Tom Morgan. Um, my, my information's out there on, on the web, right? You can find me, thmorgan at clarku.edu. Um, you can also send an email to admissions at clarku.edu, um, and I'll be happy to kind of get any of those lingering questions answered. And again, um, thank you to all the panelists for being here today and volunteering your time to help students learn more about Clark and what we're all about. So I really appreciate that. Thanks for having us. It's great to see you all. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Hope to see you in the fall.